This is a big day for iMasons and I'm sure for the iMasons scholars at Hampton University. Welcome. Uh, this past year, we've been expanding the iMason strategy. You're going to hear more about that at our APAC Regional Summit tomorrow. But one of the constants has been our focus on increasing the flow of talent into our industry. So one of the key challenges has been helping new college graduates bridge the gap to their first job in digital infrastructure. So employees often want to hire people with experience. The challenge is, of course, how do you get that experience? So guided by our education committee and chaired by Dennis Cronin, a big shout out to Dennis. Thank you very much for your leadership. Uh, we've come up with a few, a few ideas, and today we're seeing those results. So here to tell us a little bit more about what this uh, is all about is our executive director, Jeff Melchuk. Thanks, Dean. So as you know, many bachelor's degree require uh, a senior design capstone project intended to help the students integrate the learnings from their four years and apply it to a real world problem. The idea here was to create a capstone project that introduced students to the breadth of our industry from designing the infra to support booming demand through site selection to financing and designing a data center. We'd been chewing on this idea for a while when we were introduced to Hampton University a small historically black university in Southern Virginia with a small technology and engineering program that includes electrical and computer engineering and architecture. So here with us today is Dr. Demetrius Geddes, Assistant Dean of Hampton School of Engineering and Technology, and Dr. Chang Lee, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Hampton and the Faculty Advisor for the Electrical and Computer Engineering Capstone Projects. So thanks for getting us started, Dean. We'll catch up with you later. And welcome, Drs. Geddes and Lee. This is a big day for your students. Um, could you maybe tell us just a little bit about Hampton University and the School of Engineering and Technology and, and your degree program? Dr. Geddes, do you want to get us started? Sure, Jeff. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for attending our capstone design uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, just a little bit about Hampton University. Uh, as was stated, Hampton University is a private HBCU. Uh, which was founded in uh, 1868, uh, over 150 years ago, by uh, General General Samuel Chapman, Chapman Armstrong. Uh, he actually led uh, colored troops during the Civil War. Um, and when he created the university, uh, his goal was to create an institution that trained the hand, the head, and the heart um, and <clears throat> of, of the newly freed uh, slaves. And um, since that, uh, time and up to this present date, uh, we have uh, a president who's been with us for over 42 years, uh, Dr. William R. Harvey, who's continued uh, that tradition. One of our mission is to uh, make sure that we uh, promote learning, of course, build character, but as well as create industry leaders. Um, and so we currently have an enrollment of about uh, 3,500 students uh, this year, was affected by COVID, of course. Um, so about 3,000 students are undergraduates uh, and another 500 are graduate students. Um, so within the School of Engineering and Technology, where I'm the assistant dean, we have about 230 students. Um, and so each year, our engineering students must demonstrate that they uh, are capable of um, showing what they've learned the, the, past, the first three years of their academic uh, career, as well as um, be able to apply the engineering design process um, uh, during, during their senior year. And so this is a culminating event for them. Um, and so we want them to be able to show us that they have the ability to, uh, to uh, apply engineering design to produce a solution that has real uh, uh, industry specifications um, that actually considers public health, considers safety, considers economics. And so we uh, actually empower our students to actually choose their own project to, to, to demonstrate this. Um, and so um, we were fortunate that you guys were interested in uh, giving our students a pitch. And so your pitch was so uh, fascinating that two of our groups wanted to actually design data centers. Um, and so uh, they've, they've done an excellent job. So we thank you guys for that sponsorship, um, but to me, it's been more than just a sponsorship. It's actually been, uh, there's been mentorship. Uh, so we had, we had the sponsorship, mentorship, 
but also, again, this is an educational uh, thing for our students and for our department. So um, as freshmen, our students are taught a phrase, um, good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. And I hope that's <laughs> going to be on display today. Thanks so much, Dr. Guess. It's a great introduction and it's been great working with you all. So I wanted to, um, so Dr. Lee here is the, uh, the faculty advisor for the capstone directly. And I wanted to you know, ask her about where does the capstone fit in the curriculum and, and uh, uh, how has this gone this year? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, the year-long capstone design is required for all EC students to graduate. Uh, typically, the students design a project, uh, a product using their knowledge in circuits, electronics, and microcontroller, etc. And this year's iMason capstone design is very unique. Um, it has been a very interesting project. Um, I have learned a lot, and I know students have to. Um, so thank you, Jeff, for your leadership. I thank the I. Masons for providing the mentorship and sponsorship for our students. Thank you. Really awesome. appreciate it. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, you're so welcome. It's been such a great experience. So, you know, Dr. Geddes, I remember back when we got started, I think it was Philip uh, Marangella who introduced us to you and Hampton. And our first discussions were around creating a data center lab at Hampton. And we've been pretty busy actually with this Catstone project, but we've, uh, uh, made made some progress on those discussions. I don't want to come back and touch on that later, but that was sort of how we got started on this whole thing was uh, uh, thinking about a data center lab. Um, uh, so thank you to uh, Drs. Geddes and Lee for uh, that introduction to Hampton. Um, I want to introduce this now to Philip uh, and the, the other mentors who participated throughout the project. Um, so in addition to making these crucial introductions, I got this thing started. Philip has been one of the mentors who uh, was with the students week in and week out through the whole project to provide feedback and uh, help them keep on track. Um, so Philip, you were one of the sparks that lit this fire and who stoked it every week. Now, why'd you jump in with both feet like that? And what's this experience yeah. been like for you? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, Jeff, and 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 thanks um, uh, to Dr. Geddes and Dr. Lee. Re um, really, it was Dr. Geddes who reached out and and was inquiring about a kind of edge data center, if you will, in his facility. So certainly, we're, we're still working on that. But what I recognize, you know, being a member of the I, I Masons for a while, a fantastic opportunity, right? Because keep in mind, right, this is you know, we're, we're builders of the, of the digital age. Um, and, and it's, it's about education, diversity and inclusion, sustainability and innovation. Right. And, and there was a perfect opportunity again, working with you, Jeff and Dean of, of creating this capstone and, and Dr. Geddes, Dr. Lee, extremely receptive, right. And making this the pilot program. And what excites me, you know, at the end of the day, it's for the next generation, right. And it's about the students, and, and it was awesome to see as we started kicking this off, students that had no idea about what a data center is, opening their eyes to seeing, hey, it's actually kind of cool. <laughs> you know, There's a lot of cool stuff going on in here and this could be a career for me. And to that end, I'm actually really excited to say one of the students, Jai Huntley, is actually going to be a member of Edge Connects, the engineering team, and a true, you know, the next generation of the digital age is, is happening, right? And, and there's proof in the pudding. Um, and, you know, we're also talking about internships as well for some of the students who aren't graduating. That's exciting. And then, you know, next year, next semester, expanding this to other schools. So um, awesome. I mean, it's just absolutely rewarding. Um, and again, it's about the students, but it's also about my fellow mentors, right? We, you know, it's, it's about putting the taking the time and, and, and helping out the students, guiding them and showing what's really cool, what's happening inside a data, data center and how this could be a great opportunity. Um, I'm a marketing guy, right? So that's why I need smarter mentors to join me in this, this effort. So you got Bill Clayman of, of Switch, right? And, and you've got Chang Lim of, uh, from an architectural perspective, um, who's part of Sheehan, Nagel and Hartre 
architects, it was a great combination of the three of us. We all have different looks and perspectives and, and helping out the students to think both broadly on the big scale as well as you know very specific on a lot of a lot of stuff. So um, I know we're going to have a deeper dive in terms of introducing Chang on on the next session, but in this one, I, I like to pass the torch to Bill and kind of let him introduce himself and his uh, learnings and and perspective on the whole program. So uh, <laughs> I had a chance to review um, Jeff's outline as far as his presentation. I had like a little speaking spot and this is rare for me. I didn't know what to say just because this whole process has been just so, so special, uh, not just for me, but for everybody involved. Um, we've had a chance to spend, you know, hours in the evenings and in random times and, and me personally having the chances. And I'm, I love looking at all these faces on this crazy Zoom call. Um, and it hasn't just been about data centers. It's been this truly interpersonal connection with these wonderful, brilliant builders of tomorrow. Um, and, and each of these students has a really special story. And I'm honored to have you, whether you go into engineering, design, whatever is in that technical field, that I know that you as brilliant individuals are gonna be making a real change in this future. Um, personally, when I grow up, I wanna be a teacher, right? That, that's kind of like my goal. I don't think I've grown up yet, um, but that's what I wanna do when I grow up. I wanna be a professor, I wanna be a teacher, and this gives me a wonderful opportunity to connect with each and every single one of you. Throughout the course of this term and what we've been doing, um, I've learned a lot about each and every single one of you. You know, Rose, you're telling me how you're one of the first in your family go to go and get you know a, a higher level education. You've got you know Selena who's dealing with some hardships but still showing up every time, doing the work. Um, you know, Ikenna and I, dude, we we totally spoke about like Marvel and DC characters for a good like thirty to forty minutes. We weren't ignoring the topic we need to talk about, but we had a total segue, right? And you learned about some of the cool security stuff that I had a chance to do. Um, when I was younger, all that penetration, vulnerability, testing, the, the fun stuff you get to do in the, in the security operations field. Um, you know, and, and speaking with Jai and, and learning about her architectural, you know, work that she's been doing. I just, I just list every single one of these students and it was just been absolutely, from a heartfelt perspective, it's been amazing. And, and I love to see this diversity and I love to see you helping fix a lot of what the challenges are in our industry. So seeing what you've done, how far you've come, the questions that you've asked, has been truly special and inspirational because now you're actually getting the tools and um, the, the facility to actually build the stuff that we get a chance to work in every single day. And it's the modern stuff too. It's, it's the really exciting things that help deliver the zeros and ones to every single person in this, in this world. Um, I'm proud of each and every single one of you. Um, I've had a chance to work with both groups. I've seen your designs. They're different. I see you thinking outside the box. I see you coming up against challenges and facing those challenges. And, you know, you're literally building a digital infrastructure from scratch. And what's remarkable is like that somebody coming up to me, if I'm in a medical degree and say, okay, here's a fake person, go operate on them. It's like, I have to learn a lot about the human body. And you're learning a lot about digital infrastructure, the ins and outs, the power, the cooling, the server configuration, the, the converged architecture, the land cost, the, the massive amount of millions of dollars it takes to build these things and put stuff in it. You guys are awesome. And, and keep, keep having that sense of inspiration. Never lose your childhood sense of wonder. Ikenna and the rest of the team, keep talking about Marvel Super. Look, look at look, you've got, got Iron Man and, and, and Wolverine back there. Don't ever stop having that level of imagination because that's where the spark begins. You know, and kind of backing up what Philip Miller Jella said, you, you're you're the visionaries for the future, um, and that's that's so important to keep that level of creativity. Have toys in your office, think outside the box. Never ever let that kind of spirit go down because that's where you get really really creative and you create really cool things. I'm excited to hear your presentations. Um, I, I'm going to put on my I hat as if I've never seen that before, even though I've seen it a million times. Again, I just want to express from the bottom of my heart how proud I am of each and every one of you. And I want to make sure that we stay connected and I'm going to be quiet now. And I don't know who the next person is. Jeff, maybe you can help me out, but thank you for what you've done. Um, you've shown me that there's a beautiful inspiration for the next iteration of technologists in this world. And I cannot wait to work with you. Uh, thanks, man. That's that's really great. So you you guys are looking at the 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 mentor team. It was really Philip, Bill, and Chang uh, and myself who met with the students every week. And we and but there was actually one other uh, person that helped out a lot. Regina Bruton Smith um, showed up really regularly, and she's with Con Ed, and she was particularly helpful uh, with uh, power uh, issues and power purchasing, which is really helpful. 
Um, so you'll hear from these guys later. Uh, we're going to come back at the end and talk a little bit more. But I wanted to move on and, and now do a quick round of introductions of our executive evaluation team. You know, the students are going to present uh, to this panel of executives, and I just wanted to introduce the executives. How about uh, Joe Kava, Asa Nasser, and Kurt Bellasar to get us started? Good morning, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and get a chance to see the report out of your uh, capstone projects. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I invited one of my uh, team members to be a, an evaluator, um, Char up there. She, uh, um, she works out of our New York office and, uh, and I'm in California, uh, but uh, together along with all of our, the rest of our teammates, we're responsible for uh, Google's global, global data center program. So everything from uh, buying land and energy and renewable energy contracts to designing, building and operating the data centers. So we're really looking forward to uh, seeing what you guys have come up with. Thanks, Joe. How about Asen? Hi, everyone. So my name is Asen Nasser. I'm part of a data center advanced development team at Microsoft. Uh, my name here shows uh, Mark Monroe, but I'm not Mark Monroe. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, uh, my background is electrical engineering, and I'm very pleased to participate and as a uh, committee here because I used to be a student and I was electrical engineering and my path to just be a teacher and just give it feedbacks through my career and I love to see the student to uh, uh, to just pass through from uh, the one that they learn in in the school and how how they can implement a practice in industry. Uh, my background and my current focus in in an energy aspect, and I will happy uh, to uh, give feedback and help the team. Thanks. All. Thanks, Thanks Essen. Kurt? Hi, my name's Kurt Bellasar, and I lead the team at Apple that does server and storage design. And at Apple, it's a, our data set, global data center group is set up somewhat uniquely. It owns everything from uh, data center construction and data center operation worldwide, but we also have the server and storage team uh, embedded within our, our global data center team. And so that's the, the organization that I run is the server and storage design team. Um, I'm excited to be here, and uh, this is my second time evaluating the Capstone projects, and uh, I'm just really looking forward to seeing what you have today. Thanks, Kurt. I'll call on Christina, Spencer, and Eddie. Christina? As Joe mentioned, I'm a partner of his, certainly in our, our Google data center development. Um, I'm, I'm an architect. I've been through these types of presentations before. I'm so excited to be part of this and really looking forward to what the students have put together. Um, so I, I know what you're feeling right now and getting excited about presenting. Uh, really excited to be part of this. And uh, certainly introduction. Wow, I am so humbled to be in, invited to participate what an amazing effort and what an amazing circumstance that you have here. Really excited to be invited to this, Jeff, perhaps in the future. I think uh, there's wonderful things that are being done here. Um, just for knowledge, my, my particular team, so we do the management of all the engineering development for our products and our data centers. So this is global if you're talking about building structures or enclosures or cooling plants, electrical systems, people spaces, considerations towards safety, what happens on the data center floor. That's what we're engaged with and we really uh, help our engineers and our partner engineers and architects drive to conclusion to, to make the best things for Google Apple happen. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Charles Spencer. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'll echo those comments that it's, it's humbling to be included in this panel with such an exciting opportunity. Uh, I'm the chief operations officer for a company called Virtual Power Systems. We are a software-based power monitoring and orchestration platform to manage digital infrastructure components um, within data centers and, and, and outside those four walls as well. Um, I think this is particularly humbling. Um, one, because uh, as, as, an, as an interesting player in the digital infrastructure industry, I'm, I'm a, a native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. The percentage of you know, my folks in digital infrastructure or technology generally is 
pretty minuscule. And so I love the idea of this type of project, especially looking at how we can improve both um, diversity of, of thought and um, diversity by background. Um, and, and I also think that there is a, a growing need for more talent into the digital infrastructure space and having these types of programs to really um, publicize the way that uh, digital infrastructure, including data centers, work and support our larger economy are, are really important. And in, in for, for decades, it's been a bit of an uphill, uphill battle with most geographies to try and just identify what digital infrastructure is. So I think this is fantastic. Oh, thanks, Spencer. Uh, Eddie and then Taryn and Eric. Hello. Yes, thank you. My name is Eddie Shooter, okay, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Switch, which is a uh, technology company that also does uh, data center co-location and telecommunications uh, industry projects as well, and uh, as well as energy projects, sustainable energy. We're very excited to be and honored to be a part of this panel. Um, we uh, look forward to seeing your presentations and continuing to do great work in this industry with our new partners. So thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Taryn? Uh, thank you, Jeff, for inviting me to this, uh, to this really special uh, initiative on education and uh, this wonderful panel. Uh, my name is Tarun Raisoni. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of a small company called Rahi Systems. We provide uh, data center solutions and services. And uh, uh, education was the only reason why I was able to get into the data center industry and have uh, really a nice career for uh, the last 20 plus years in the data center industry. So anything related to education initiatives touches my heart as well, because uh, uh, you know education is a continuous learning process. So really appreciate being on this panel. Thank you. Sure, Taryn, thanks. Uh, Eric Wilcox and then Dean. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Eric Wilcox. I'm the global, global leader of data center engineering for Amazon Web Services, uh, specifically around the facility infrastructure and uh, you know what I wanted to share with the team is uh, I, this brought me back to when I was uh, leaving university and going to my first first job. It was actually for EMC Corporation, and my first manager said, "You know, welcome to power. You'll never leave power. It's a small industry. We need more engineers, and there's plenty to be done." But I can tell you, 25 years later, it is a very small industry. Uh, a lot of familiar faces on this phone, uh, this this uh, Zoom call. Sorry. And uh, you know, it is a great way to manage your career. There's nothing but upper bounds in terms of where the data center industry is going. Uh, I'm glad that you got an opportunity through iMasons, who's doing a great job to bring the uh, you know, that infrastructure industry to the forefront so you can see where the opportunities lie. And uh, as somebody who's been in the industry for 25 years, I can tell you it's a great place to be and, and plenty of opportunity. So, you know, well, welcome to the community, and I wish you the best of luck with your projects. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Dean, and then Pete, Peter Cazella. Excellent. Um, so Dean Nelson, I'm the chairman and founder of Infrastructure Masons. I love this community, um, and also the CEO of Virtual Power Systems. And I, I think I echo what everyone is saying here. I'm so proud of the program that's put together. And let me just tell you one thing. I love the fact that uh, we've already hired one. So Phil, Philip, I think you, you've already pulled one. Um, we have lots of jobs and lots of needs. We need young, creative minds to fill those. So I'm really excited to see what you guys are coming up with because it's that completely open mind to look at a problem that's going to come up with creative solutions that us that might have had more narrow view because of so many years may not see. So I'm very curious to see what you guys come up with. Thanks, Peter. And then Anna. Good morning, everybody. Peter Cazella from Picasa. Uh, critical facilities recruiting, uh, headhunter. I guess there's no other way to sugarcoat it, but uh, looking forward to some excellent uh, presentations here in Capstone. And uh, some of you have uh, been already reached out by some of my team just uh, on your LinkedIn profiles uh, to help you leverage your Capstone project, to help you leverage your LinkedIn, to evaluate your resume and make sure you're properly leveraging what you're doing right now so you can ultimately get a job. Right, because that's really the end, end game here. So it's good to see one one of you already had uh, as, as an offer out there. Um, and you uh, know, at the end of the day, this is what we're doing. We're trying to leverage all this. So we'll have some some tidbits. There's some stuff on our website with some white papers that help pay it forward uh, to you know not only uh, this group but to others 
that we uh, we do um, and, and ultimately allow uh, to go out there and leverage what you have in your background, your, your skill set, your, your people, your network. And this is a big network that you're on right now. So it's definitely important for us to show you how to do it properly. Um, we might not be able to provide the position for you, but at least we'll help you set up your way because as I Mason, you know, members as well, we like to help pay it forward and be able to show how to properly leverage your skill sets and your network to get something. So I don't have any IT position, so to speak. We're on the data center facility side and we do it nationwide. So looking forward to a great presentation today. Thanks, Thanks. Peter and Aina. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Ada Murphy. I'm the Senior Vice President of Operations at Yonder Group in the Americas. At Yonder are a data center developer, owner, operator. Uh, operations across four continents and uh, expanding rapidly across the Americas. So I leave Canada through Patagonia. Um, we're a proud sponsor of the iMasons education effort and excited to learn from the students here today. Um, also, committed to, to gender parity and diversity in the industry. So I'm looking forward to seeing the presentations and uh, sharing the job offerings that we've got uh, open at Yonder as we scale. Fantastic. So that's, that's our executive panel for this first session. A pretty impressive group. Um, just remember, this has been a year long, two semester project executed for the first time ever uh, uh, virtually due to COVID. Uh, so we were just kind of lucky that we uh, jumped into Hampton at the same time COVID did. So there you go. These students haven't seen each other face to face for this entire school year, I don't believe. So uh, for the first term, the students were given a fictitious mobile app uh, with a given latency and bandwidth requirements and a user growth curve in the US. Uh, market and their assignment was to figure out how many data centers of what size to build where to service the app's growth. Um, and they had to consider all the typical things for site selection, which I won't go through. Uh, they presented that at the end of the first term in November uh, and were evaluated on that. So I just wanted to set that as context. That was their first term thing and it's done. Uh, so for the second term here, um, which just started in January. The assignment was to pick one of those sites they selected in the first term and build a data center on paper. So they had to you know, select all the equipment to develop a cooling scheme, uh, how much power is it gonna take, lay out the facility, um, you know, design the hot aisle, cold aisles, the, you know, the whole facility. And remember we have half architects on these teams. So uh, that, that was really helpful. Uh, and they had to then find, uh, finish with developing a CapEx and an OpEx budget uh, uh, for, your, for your review. Um, so that's what we'll see today. Well, without further ado, let's get to Rose Nguyen, the team leader of Team One. Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Rose Nguyen. I am a graduating senior electrical engineer major from Buffalo, New York. Um, I am the team lead, so um, co-lead is Selena. Uh, so she will be bringing up the presentation. We're first going to start off with our introduction. So I'm um, starting with Jason. Hi, good morning. My name is Jason Carter, third year architecture student from Hampton University and originally from Jamaica. Hey everybody, my name is Dalton Flory. Uh, I'm from Lisbon, Ohio. I'm a third year architecture student at Hampton University. Um, and yeah, thanks for everybody. Hi, my name is Selena Jawad. I am a graduating senior, a computer engineer major from uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, here at Hampton University. Hey guys, my name is Chauncey Upshaw. I'm a graduating senior, computer engineer major, computer science minor from Laurel, Maryland, from the real DMV. Okay, so we're just going to go um, right ahead into our presentation. Here's our agenda. So we'll be having a little overview. Um, so this will have you know, background information on acne pain along with the requirements, constraints, assumptions of going into the building a site plan. Um, I'll be going over power, Selena will be going over networking, Chanti will go over the mechanical components and the financials. So acne paint. So acne paint is um, a global paint manufacturer. So they actually develop an application uh, in the US uh, in 2017. So this, what this application does, it allows the user to take a photo of um, any room that they want to paint, uh, different colors as well. So they'd be able to visualize, you know, what color of the room that they would like, and also how much paint is needed for that room. 
So Acne Paint utilized co-locations in 2019. Uh, so this was to, you know, to support the growth of the application. So this sparked um, an increase of um, people just being aware of the application along with an increase of sales. So about 50% of sales were purchased through this app. And uh, what they, uh, what the users, you know, mainly used the app for was to change the color of the room to what colors that they liked. So Acne Paint CFO, uh, they did ask the IT team. So, you know, we'll be the IT team <laughs> to develop a proposal. And uh, what this proposal, you know, needs to include is how the data center uh, would be, you know, created and operated for Acne Paint. So um, just uh, a little bit more information from last semester, uh, our application requirements and constraints. So um, we are focusing on the uh, data center facility, but you know, uh, since we do need to know the application requirements and constraints uh, to know how many data centers we may need, the size of them and whatnot. So our latency that was uh, given to us was 20 milliseconds. And uh, what this app needs to have is uh, to be able to take and transmit 2.5 megabyte photos to the server with the 500 kilobyte of other data. Uh, so this app also needs to store multiple photos with different color schemes and uh, be, to be able to share, you know, whatever they did create and message. So uh, being that you're, you are able to purchase through this application, uh, this needs to, be, uh, needs to have a secure encryption for the user's profile and payments. So some constraints uh, are the CIO wants to have a 99.99% uptime and to also be committed to 100% renewable energy by 2025. So um, just you know, to lay out some values uh, to keep in mind throughout the presentation, uh, our important values are um, our IT load. So our IT load is about 0.486 megawatts. Our total facility power pretty high is about 27.7 kilowatts. Our PUE was calculated at um, 1.87 and our DCIE um, was also calculated at about 53.25%. So again, just to go over the latency requirement, uh, it's at 20 milliseconds. And to meet the latency requirements, we determined we needed a minimum of two data centers, uh, again, which we covered last semester. And from all that information and the assumptions for the site selections, uh, we picked two locations, one in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and the second in Henrico County, Virginia. And a lot of those in, uh, factors were one, environmental factors, which were uh, the floodplains, natural disasters like hurricanes, um, tornadoes, and also elevation. The other considerations was obviously the latency, and so that's why we have two locations, as well as connection to existing power lines and also to fiber optics. Within this center, we have the vicinity map of Henrico County, uh, Virginia. We picked one location and kind of concreted that and got more information for that. As in Colorado Springs, our floor plan and building will basically be the same. Um, and so we have it here in Henrico County as there are also other data centers there. So that was a prime location for us. Um, these are some of the design process that we had. So we have a original bubble diagram on the left-hand side. And we were originally gonna do you know, two levels and you can see how it was really spread out and we had a lot into the program. And then on the right-hand side for the final bubble diagram is really just a consolidated area of really uh, the main server hall and then everything we worked around that. Okay, so we're looking at the site plan. Basically the orientation of the building matches the actual lot layout itself. We then consider how we're gonna go about in terms of um, egress to the site. So we enter on two sides, the eastern side and also on the western side. The eastern side is basically the entry where the front of the office employee or staff will use in terms of parking area. And to the western side is the entry where our delivery trucks will come in and basically back up to the loading area. The hatch area at the back top left is basically reflecting where we would have future expansion. Also to the right where you see the blue and the red is basically where the power and fiber would enter the site. On this slide is an overall view of the data center in terms of the adjacencies and the rooms. 
in bright yellow is actually the server room. To the top left of that is the power is the power and switch room. Basically, keeping those two in in tandem with each other, based on the fact that they're feeding each other directly. To the bottom left is the fire station, and to the right of that is a storage. And to the front, to the right, extreme right is where you have the front of office. The front of office basically deals with. Um, your staffing and how you enter the building and the security measures that you have to pass through before you can enter into the circulation area to enter the server room. This slide just basically give you a more overall view without the colors so you can have a better um, feel of the actual flow through the space and you can actually see where the cabling come in for the data and the power. This slide is basically a reflected ceiling plan. We showed the route in terms of how the cabling run to the other areas in terms of in terms of um, supplying the services and the engineer will uh, expand on that a little bit more. This is basically a sectional view that shows you our floor to ceiling height or floor to under slab height and the services that will run throughout the space and how it's routed throughout the space. So um, we'll be going into power in this section. So just some um, assumptions with power. Uh, since we are looking in the Henrico County, Virginia, Dominion Energy would be the main um, provider for uh, power. So that utility collection um, is at 38 kilovolts, uh, the rating of that. So um, it's up pretty high because uh, the area itself, the city itself, um, they do believe in the data center market. And uh, so the utilities are increased to 38 uh, kilovolts connection. So any data centers that are um, getting built in the area would be able to tap into the line itself. So, um, you know, that was a, a really neat thing with um, Henrico County. And also it does eliminate the need for high voltage. Um, but for our data centers, you know, we're more so going to stay with the low voltage area. And um, another thing I, I had learned was the transformer is usually provided by the utility company. So just some um, of the power components that uh, we decided to go with. Um, our first one is the Tesla Megapack. So these are the backup generators um, for our low voltage transformer, which will be sitting in-house of the um, in the power room would be the Hitachi ABB. Um, so majority of the power components are from ABB. So the system pro E would be the, the panels, the switchboard. Um, Wave pro two are the bus waves. Uh, the true one ACS are the automatic transfer switches and the EMAX two are for um, the circuit breakers. So here we do have um, the power entry. Uh, Jason had uh, went over it briefly. Um, so on the top picture, uh, we do see that, that sectional um, diagram. So at the top, uh, we see the power cable, uh, which are the red dotted lines. So that is going overhead and those are accessed by ladders. Um, and uh, there's the conduit at the bottom. So that's where the uh, power would be entering from, you know, from the um, outside from that transmission provided by the utility company. So uh, that's how the, uh, the site would, you know, get gets its power. Um, the bottom left uh, picture, we see the, um, the red line coming along the sidewalk. So in that area, the power lines are actually along the sidewalk of that lot. So it would be, you know, um, fairly easy for us to be able to tap into that, that power line I mentioned before. Uh, so we wouldn't have to have um, any major, you know, power construction done on the site. So um, another, uh, diagram to the bottom right, uh, just seeing the electrical power line going into the switchboard. And in that power room, we see we have the um, one main switchboard. So that switchboard um, actually with ABB, since it's a smart panel, we're able to just add on to it. So um, that was really neat that I, I thought about with, uh, with that. And then also it's pretty, um, it's a smaller dimension compared to a lot of the older switchboards. So that transformer will be sitting in that corner. Uh, so the transformer is a dry type. So um, it would be, uh, it's more beneficial for a, a smaller facility like ours. And we do have that R3 UPS system lined up against the wall. So it's lined up against the wall because uh, the vent for the hot air 
to come out of is on top of the cabinet. So we're able to have it against the wall um, just lined up like that. So that was pretty neat about the UPS chosen. So going into our one line diagram, um, this was, you know, this was new, definitely did learn a lot um, and actually uh, applied a lot of what I did learn um, throughout my four years to this. So uh, I did go with the application easy power on this, um, met with a lot of people um, in regards to, you know, how to create a one-line diagram and how to use one. So um, first you see our primary source. So that would be coming from the utility, Dominion Energy already rated at that 38 kilovolts. Um, that goes down to that transformer. So 38 down to 15 kilovolts. Um, again, that would be provided by the company that goes to its first bus. So we could see that um, that bus is connected to an uh, automatic transfer switch and ACS. So if for some reason the primary does fail, um, that transfer switch is gonna switch on the generators, uh, which are rated at the three megavolts, down to the two uh, low voltage switchboards. Um, so next slide. So from there, we see um, that's where it's gonna uh, start going to its loads. So um, low voltage switchboard one will primarily uh, power on the mechanical load. So with that mechanical load, we only have um, the HVAC system um, that's rated at 192 kilowatts. And um, in case, you know, for some reason, uh, low voltage switchboard one is being worked on, um, the low voltage switchboard two would power, power the mechanical load. So those are switches there in place. Um, same concept with bus two, um, but it's being primarily uh, powered on by the low voltage switchboard two and um, alternate power would be from switchboard one. So we do need another transformer um, in order to support the remainder of the components uh, with the input load of 208 volts. So that's where that low voltage uh, transformer will come in at um, bus number two, which then connects into low voltage switchboard three. So this houses the cooling and the IT load. And we do see here that um, I did decide to go with the UPS being um, as obviously the alternative source of power in case the primary does fail. So I do have um, the two connected here for the, um, for the two loads. Um, again, same concept with the switches, but this time we'll just focus on the IT load to the left. So um, we do have two UPSs to support the IT load. Obviously, since the IT load does house um, the, our data, we need that running at all times. So um, same concept going on there. But one thing um, I did have uh, trouble on was uh, showing the PDU since that was not a component on the application being used. But since the PDU is just a transform and a distribution, um, I just you know created that myself. So we do have a total of 42 racks. Uh, with 42 racks, we wanted to have uh, two PDUs per rack. So with that, um, that means 84 PDUs. And just for the sake of space, I just decided to concentrate on three racks itself. Um, so I did provide six PDUs, um, two for each rack, and each rack is rated at uh, 4.426 kilowatts. And um, you know, to, to maintain, uh, I guess, like stability, um, going, looking into the cooling, uh, section, the cooling load, we do see um, that there's one cooling system and one air handler. So um, it's one cooling system and air handler to each, but one cooling system to three servers. So three racks, um, my apologies. So um, we do have a total of 16 cooling systems um, of the in row cooling and 16 of the air handlers, but again, for the sake of space and to just be um, you know, uh, similar with the PDU, we just decided to show that one to three. So uh, just uh, to reiterate power redundancy being shown in the power uh, distribution schematic, the one line, um, we are a tier three data center. So our uptime would be about, I believe it was like 9.9 .9, or 99.98%. Um, and uh, our main focus for the power distribution schematic is to have, um, to be sure it's concurrently maintainable. Uh, we do have that one primary source who will be coming from the utilities, the minute energy, our two backup generators in case it does fail, um, our three UPS systems. So again, two for the IT, one for the cooling, system, or the cooling 
yeah, system load and multiple low voltage sub panels. So my section was more focused on the technical components of the racks and also the network infrastructure. Um, so just a little bit that I wanted to touch on, uh, this was just some information from last semester that I feel was a little important. Um, we did decide that for our design for our racks that we were going to do something related to the flash stacks. Um, so the way that we had it set up is that we will have our three chassis per racks uh, filled with four servers. So at half capacity of the Cisco UCS B series blade servers. Um, and also for the sake of network redundancy, also having the two firewalls per rack. Um, and we'll be using the Palo Altos for those. Um, we did stick with Cisco for our switches and our interconnects. And also we will have that one chassis of the flash blade, but also at half capacity. And this is all uh, still able to support what we have for now, uh, but leaving room for growth so that we don't have to do too much physically besides add to the racks that already exist. This was just the uh, just to reiterate what the architects had mentioned earlier. Um, the fiber optic cabling that would be going into our building, this is just the site uh, view of what it would look like coming in. Um, just based on what we had found uh, around, this is about where we would think they would be putting that in. Because I do know that the ISP that we choose is going to be the ones to uh, overall determine how that's going to work. But this is just our assumption on how that would be feeding into our data center. And I just did a bit of a 3D um, view just so that you can see uh, just a little to understand that it's going to be coming from that backbone fiber and into that street cabinet. And of course, we want to make sure that our street cabinet is secure. Um, so we will have that fenced in. And then, of course, the fiber entry that goes into the ONT. Um, and you could see it on the uh, two slides ago, uh, but just to uh, touch on it, the reason that there are the, red, uh, the green and the blue lines uh, is because we are trying to make sure that we have our two networks. Um, so we will have two ONTs, uh, two networks running throughout the uh, building. And this is just the uh, building schematic of how we're going to be distributing the uh, network throughout the building. Um, just wanted to make sure that we got that uh, connection to any of the important rooms, uh, such as security, of course, the server error area, um, the power switches, just definitely need to make sure that everything that is important to be connected is connected. And uh, just uh, to show it uh, from the side view, um, just to iterate that our network is not uh, going to be running underneath, but above via ladders. Um, so that is uh, up there on the top, the red and green lines there. Uh, so that is how those will be connecting to our racks uh, from the top overhead ladders. Um, and you can also see the conduits there. And just to touch a bit on the network redundancy. Um, so each server is going to be connected to both ISPs. Um, and of course, um, we want to be able to make sure that uh, we're going to have uh, our connection to it no matter what. Uh, so we do have both remote managements, uh, just two separate uh, cables for both of those, just making sure that everything is connected uh, dually. And of course, all of the uh, components as well, as you can see with the uh, green and the lighter green, and of course, with the yellow and the lighter yellow. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that it was all touching on it. And again, that is all of the components that will be going into it. And just to touch a bit on the uh, network diagram, uh, just how we thought we, we would uh, be separating our network. Um, so our four branches that we had thought to have, of course, it would come in from the internet uh, through our firewall router. And then of course, uh, into our firewalls for this, uh, for this branch for the racks. Uh, it's gonna hit that firewall, go to that switch rack and the servers. Um, and then of course, we wanna make sure that we have access control. Um, and uh, going into the right side, um, that is gonna be where we would have all of our LAN. Uh, so basically any of the, the company phones, uh, the PCs that plug into the actual physical network, uh, that would be that branch there. And uh, we did also decide to have two separate uh, 
networks for the Wi-Fi, uh, just one public one that would be password protected and one private one that's more for the company. And I'll definitely touch up on more on that in another slide. And just also wanted to mention that we, um, getting into a little bit of the security side of it, um, we wanted to make sure that um, our, of course, our facility is secure. So we decided to use fixed box cameras basically for the perimeter of the actual building, uh, just because anyone who gets close to the data center uh, within these red lines, uh, you would be able to identify their faces from those cameras. Um, and then with the red scan down below, um, each of these stars is one of the red scans for the laser fencing. Um, I'll touch on that more again in a later slide. Um, and of course, the thermal cameras for the actual perimeter uh, surveillance. And then of course, indoors, we wanna have our 360 cameras. Um, we decided to go with the 360s because it is four in one. And uh, just a quick video uh, to touch on the security of our building.
every incorrect attempt is sent to our security guards, and after three, the card will be deactivated and therefore unable to be used to authenticate, not until it's brought down to our security and released from quarantine. They will already be aware of the failed attempts, as they will be alerted. I know you thought you were in the clear, but sorry, Bob. Better luck next time. Even if you are escorted into the hallways, you won't be able to traverse through them alone. You will not be permitted to enter or exit without someone to let you through every access point. Now, Bobby, you're here to fix the age facts, but it seems like you're attempting to touch something else. Too bad for you, the security has been made aware that you are here for HVAC only, and therefore our red skins will also be activated overhead in all the zones that are dedicated to the ladders and our fiber to protect all of our assets. This can only be deactivated by our security, so I wouldn't touch that if I were you. Oh my, it seems that you're on your last resort. You may not have been able to bring a computer of your own, but you brought a USB of your own for your data that you say you need to view in order to fix the HVAC? It's in our best interest that no USBs that are not pre-approved by the company are allowed to be connected to our company laptops. So you won't be able to upload any malware to our private networks with that trick. And no, you may not use any of our encrypted laptops. Sorry about it, but better luck next time. Thanks to the Palo Alto firewall, our cybersecurity is out of this world. Our network is protected by Palo Alto's machine learning powered next generation firewalls. With the power of machine learning, these babies are able to enforce security for users at any location on any device while adapting its policy in response to user activity. The 3200s will easily prevent malicious activity concealed in encrypted traffic. They can identify and categorize all applications on all ports all the time with full seven layer inspection. This is only the beginning of the power behind our data center cybersecurity. So, Robert, have you met your match? Giving up already? I understand. You may have picked a fight with the wrong facility. It's okay, Bobby. Better luck next time. Good afternoon again, and I'll be introducing the cooling system, the HVAC, and the budget. Now, the cooling system is split up into two parts, the indoor and the outdoor units. The indoor will extract the hot air from the mechanical heat coming from the servers on one end, and on the other end, it will be exporting the air to the servers. The other part of the system is the air handler, which will be collaborating with the indoor unit by releasing the hot air and importing in the good air, cool air. To make sure the hot and cold air do not mix, they have two separate pipes. Now the HVAC system will be on the roof, entering the building through the plenum area, which is a space between the ceiling and the roof. This will be providing support to not just the server room, but for the whole building. So the first diagram you see before you is the containment technique. The containment technique is a strategy used by data centers to either isolate the hot cool air or the hot air. Now the containment was necessary because it will improve the energy efficiency, which was one of the requirements from the CFO. We decided to use hot air, hot, air, hot air containment. Now why? The main reason was we wanted the general data center space to remain cool. That means that the general area where the system is located should be the same temperature that the, temperature, um, the servers are taking in. For example, if one of the engineers was to go in the data center, they can gauge whether or not the temperature is above or below the required threshold. This will alert the individual whether or not action needs to be taking place. Now on the bottom of your screen, you will see the uh, second picture which demonstrates the hot air exhaust and it's a visual of how it will be transported through the um, building. Now this diagram illustrates how the hot air flows through the cooling system. The hot air will be transported to the outdoor unit where there is a heat exchange and which will import the cool air then transport it back into the indoor unit where it is released into the data center floor and then the servers will then be able to absorb the cool air. Now for the HVAC system, each room is given the zone based off of how much air, how much air is needed. So zone A is a server room and the power room. This air needs to be cycled every one to four minutes because it's very time critical. Zone B is the uh, fire room where it is air needs to be cycled every two to five minutes. Zone C is a storage room where the air needs to be cycled every three to seven minutes to remove unwanted related fumes. And zone D is everything else, including the walkway, the restroom, the conference room, the security room, the lobby. And that air, air will be cycled every four to 10 minutes. Now, this is just a, 
uh, visualization on how the HVAC system will potentially look in the plenum, which is again, the um, space between the ceiling and the roof. Now, this is our budget based on the equipment research and it's separated by room. So this first room you see is a server room. It has the different servers that we're using, the firewalls, the switches, the stores, the chassis, the PDUs, and the racks. And then at the bottom, you have the uh, total cost for each room. So this is a um, server room. So in the next um, column, we will have the cooling system, which includes the in-row cooling and HVAC, and they both come with insulation costs. So we, I included that. We have the power room, and which includes the UPS and the power distribution that um, Rose have previously discussed. And then we have the security room, which is the, the fixed box, the thermal cam, the red scan, the 360. And then we have the keypad, the security card, and the active ID that Selena was demonstrating to us previously. And at the bottom, we will have the total fixed capital investment for just the equipment. So right here is the economics inputs. It shows the rates that I use based on different companies and state rates. So for example, the property tax in Henrico, Virginia is different from Colorado Springs. So I had to organize this separately so that it's very easy to look at and to see that there's a difference in how I should calculate it differently. And then at the bottom, you will see the utility cost for Colorado. It has the uh, water, it has a sewer, and then it has the, um, and then I go into the Virginia cost, which is different because they had a distribution charge and they have an electronic supply service charge for utility. So then, then there's the water and then the server. Now, right here, this document is the total capital investment. Now, this is all the equipment that is gathered and are presented in a well-organized way. So as you can see, there, the only difference between this one and the equipment is that I included the building management. So that will be just the total equipment cost, which was $13,092,083.56. And then we had the direct cost and each um, line, I split it up into what is being um, paid for and how is the percentage in terms of the uh, total equipment cost. And then I was able to provide a subtotal at the right and at the bottom, you see the total direct costs. And then you have the indirect costs, which is the preliminary costing. So that the testing of the equipment and making sure everything is good to go. And then we have the contingency because things happen and we have to be aware of that. So that's why I include in the budget as well. And at the bottom, you will see the two state different um, capital investments. So we have the Virginia fixed capital investment and the Colorado fixed capital investments. And then at the bottom, it will be the total fixed capital investment, which rounds about 50 million. So this is the operational expense. This demonstrates um, what we'll be using in the operational expense. The only thing that we did not include was the employee salaries because that is going to be based off of the company and they can they can determine how much they want to pay for each um, person. So we have the power and then on the bottom we have the consumables which is the water, sewer, diesel fuel. We have the regular maintenance which is servicing our critical equipment. Then we have the operational expenses which is a property tax, the fiber optic cabling and the network capacity. And then we had the building assurance because um, every building has insurance and we need that to um, incorporate that into our budget. So the total operational expense will round out to $1.15 million. This is just a brief economic summary of how it, the overall budget for the next four years. So the first year, of course, is just a fixed capital investment because we are doing the construction costs. And then we applied the operational expense throughout the next four years. And our total budget for the uh, 50, uh, for our four years is a 54 million. And that is, include, that is in case that we're getting exactly no revenue. That's how much we will owe approximately. So our capital expense total is 47 or um, 50 million. Uh, compared to the proposed budget, which is the different, which is the, um, the same amount of money compared to our competitors that have like the same amount of space. But what you have to realize is first we are a co-location. So we're two different buildings. And that means we have to pay two different times for the um, construction costs and every all the equipment. And we have to realize that 
they're not having the same expectations of us because we have to satisfy the latency requirement, which is very expensive. And that's something that we couldn't get around. The operational expense were lower than the average operational expense, but we did not include the employee salary. So that couldn't bring it up, but still will be like a little bit short of the average operational expense. To conclude our presentation, I just want to talk about a few of our important takeaways. Um, just for me, um, I feel like a data center technology is just constantly evolving and data is just a lot more important and a lot more expensive in today's world than I could have ever imagined. Uh, like it's really no wonder that we have to subscribe for so many services nowadays. Uh, Rose's key takeaway, she says that integration is key. Seeing all of our work integrating really shows how much we rely on each other to create a data center. Uh, from Chauncey, he says, this research will help me put things into perspective, especially for my future ventures. And from Dalton, he says, collaboration is when we really accomplish all of our goals. This is a team effort. Jason says, there is more in-depth research needed than one would assume needed to build a data center. And uh, just a, a list of all of our mentors that helped us. It was a lot of people, um, but we really wanna thank you guys. You guys were a big help. Honestly, we could not have done this without you because there is so much we didn't know. And so many nights when you guys would take the time out just to make sure that we understand what we're doing here. So thank you so much. And even to those that were there for our presentations weekly, especially you guys, because your feedback is what gave us direction when we didn't have any. So thank you guys so much. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you to all the students. Uh, really, uh, really uh, impressive to see, especially starting from zero a few months ago. So I want to open it up to questions from the um, executive evaluators. I have one quick question. This is Eric Wilcox from Amazon. Uh, great job on the presentation, by the way. I know a lot of work goes into doing a end-to-end -end data center. So fantastic work. Uh, I think your bad actor's name was, was Bobby. Uh, you know, and you had to walk Bobby through the data center hall for uh, repairing the, the HVAC system. Given the focus and the appropriate uh, concern around security, did you consider pooling systems that wouldn't meet, require Bobby to go into the data center area? Uh, had you considered that as part of your uh, alternate or a potential solution? You know, actually, I don't think we did consider that. Chauncey, have you, uh, do you have any comments on that? Yes. Yeah, so um, our um, our data or our engineers are going to be more tailored and more trained to um, do the cooling system. The people who will be out will be outsourcing is just the HVAC system. That's the only people we're going to be outsourcing. Everything else is going to be internal. And, and that's fair. Just food for thought. You know, obviously a lot of complex parameters that, that define the right solution. Uh, and I just wonder if you kind of reflect on this a little bit. Could an alternate cooling solution uh, that maybe was either perimeter driven or outside that room prevented the need for any uh, external parties to enter your data hall. Right, that, that is another thing we can do to make sure people don't even have access at all. So that you're right. Great work team, really terrific. I love the detail across all the different areas. You really, and the collaboration comments at the end, fantastic. It, it truly is a team effort and everything that we do for all of our data centers, all these team members that are here in, in their respective businesses. Um, I especially appreciate from the site planning aspect that you're looking for future growth to your data center. Um, the, the success that you will have for this particular app in this data center and how secure it is and how you're managing the systems and, and looking at the layout and being conscious of the people that will be working there for their the public spaces, the private spaces, really well done. So um, congratulations on, on considering the, the overall footprint and the growth and two different areas as well. So I have a uh, question. Uh, this is Esson from uh, Microsoft. Uh, first of all, that was a great presentation. It was just well co cover, comprehensive, and well uh, presented. Thanks to the team for uh, great work. So I have a uh, question about the uh, uh, for a backup system, you mentioned about that you're going to use the battery as a backup, but during the presentation, I see that it switched back to the generator. Uh, can you just please explain a bit? Uh, you changed the design or the requirement, it was a different than what you have done in a design of the, electric, of the electrical system. 
Yes, so um, the generators are used primarily as the backup generator to um, to run power mainly for um, the whole facility, whereas the UPS systems, those would be the you know backup in case um, it does fail uh, for the IT load and the cooling um, system. So that's that's where I was trying to go about with um, the backup batteries. So I mean the Tesla that you mentioned is uh, the UPS side. You you think? Or, or the Tesla Megapack? That's the generators itself. So um, that's that's ran by um, solar, solar power. So um, there is an actually a DC battery there that would um, come with all the components that houses like the um, inverter from AC to DC and the, the storage bank for that as well. So that's that's where that battery will be coming from. Okay, okay, thanks. Any other questions or comments from our uh... Our panelists, we have, uh, you've, if not, you've put us back on schedule. You guys weren't as uh, as chatty as I thought you might be. So um, good job to the panelists. Any, any last questions? I just wanted to make a comment to the team that it takes a lot of people, a lot of work to pull together all the integrated requirements in order to do a full stack assignment like this. And so I just wanted to congratulate you on all the concepts and the things you thought through. And I'm sure you'll go back later and think about all the things you didn't think about. My very first data center I built, I forgot to put air conditioning and heating in the administrative section. So everybody hated me for a year, but just giving you an idea of how all of these things come together is pretty impressive. And I congratulate you on your work. Yeah, I, uh, um, I think the team did an excellent job. I think you, you captured the vast majority of all the considerations um, just for your own kind of information. You can probably assume roughly about another 30 to 40% to on top of your OPEX for your salaries and benefits and all of that. So that's just a rough order approximation, just so that you'll kind of get an idea of what, what type of total OPEX you can uh, expect. Um, one other thing is that uh, as you're doing site selection, and it was probably beyond the scope of this project, but um, don't forget to consider what types of natural disasters are likely going to be in each of those areas because uh, if you harden against certain natural disasters, it can dramatically increase your base building uh, core and shell costs. Um, and then the only last comment was as you're in real life, as some of you are going to be um, moving into this industry, I hope, uh, you know, um, look at uh, diverse paths for your network feeds, your uh, fiber optics, uh, because um, Oddly enough, one of the most common failure modes is construction in the area that severs uh, fiber optic uh, links. And if you've got diverse feeds coming to your site from two different ISPs, then you uh, have a much, much higher uh, level of resiliency. But overall, I think the team did an excellent job of bringing in the multi-disciplines and working together as a, uh, as a unit to, you know, this is real life. This is exactly as, as Char was saying, this is how we do it in our team. So. Um, it's a real life uh, example and, and you did uh, exceptionally well. Congratulations. Fantastic. Thank you to uh, first the students, of course, for this, uh, you know, you, you've reached the end, of, uh, the end of your term and you graduate this week or next week. So uh, congratulations on that and congratulations on the, on the uh, presentation. And thank you very much to our uh, evaluator team as well. Um, Great to give the students the benefit of your experience. So while while the evaluators maybe finish up those sheets, let me invite uh, Philip uh, and Bill and Chang back to talk a little bit about what the plans are for next year. So Hampton is part of a consortium of the electrical and computer engineering departments of 18 minority serving institutions, mostly HBCUs and Hispanic serving institutions called the Inclusive Engineering Consortium, it's IEC.org. Uh, and so that this co collaboration makes up of a super department of 180 faculty and 2000 students. We've been in conversation with the IEC since starting this project. Uh, and tomorrow we're meeting with reps of many of the schools of the IEC to talk about uh, how this project wrapped up and we're going to pitch them uh, for those schools to host an iMasons capstone project at their school next year. Uh, and this year, I, uh, we had four dedicated mentors, uh, Philip, Bill, and Chang, and myself. And we're all going to uh, go be lead mentors at new schools next year. And each of us is going to need another little team of mentors 
you know, to meet with the students every week and answer questions and keep them on track, just like the four of us did uh, with the Hampton students this year. So if any of you on the line uh, are interested in, in working with the student team through an academic year to get to this point next year, we wanna hear from you. Um, so this year with uh, our one mentor team, we had two student teams. We got about a dozen students aware of our industry and moving towards us potentially. And next year it should be 30 or 40. So, uh, uh, so we're moving in that direction, which is really great. So that's the first ask is if you can be a mentor, we'd love your participation. The second ask uh, is when the students needed to know something throughout the project, you just show, uh, saw that Rose showed the full page of people that she spoke to in the industry that uh, provided expertise. Uh, if any of you wanna be an expert on call, if you, uh, you know, can answer questions about what's a UPS or what does two n plus one mean, or how, you know, how do you, what is a what is a schematic for that look like? Um, we'd love to have you just on an expert on call list. So if you can answer those questions, that'd be great. Um, the third way you can all get involved is uh, iMasons provided all these students a scholarship uh, to help with tuition while they're learning about our industry. The funds that make that possible all came from you all, uh, iMasons members around the world. Uh, our new 501c3 charity that we set up, that iMason set up, uh, is in business and it's connected to the employee giving programs and the employer match programs at Apple, AWS, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, many other large corporations. So if you work at those companies, the best way to donate is through your company because your company will match and it doubles your donation. And also personal donations to the scholarship uh, uh, program are now tax deductible. So we set a goal a little over two years ago to raise a, a million dollars for scholarships and we're over halfway there already. So if you, any of you wanna make a personal donation, uh, just go to imasons.org slash donate. And there's a you know online link uh, uh, to make a tax deductible donation. So that's the third way you can, you can participate. Uh, also, I just wanted to mention, we're continuing to work with IEC uh, to develop a data center uh, lab uh, curriculum uh, that can, you know, a curriculum that can be taught in a physical hands-on lab. Uh, and our vision is to create data center labs, both at schools and probably in commercial data centers around the country that students can interact with. Uh, and so we're developing the curriculum that is taught in those, uh, those labs. That's gonna be a project to uh, develop that curriculum. But think of what that would be like uh, to have students at uh, you know, a dozen schools around the world uh, all using a similar curriculum. So uh, we're working on that project. If you wanna participate, let, let us know. And finally, a few of these students that we saw today are still holding out for just the right job in our industry. So if one of them might round out your team, uh, we put links to their LinkedIn pages on our website. And uh, I'll put that in chat in just a moment. Reach out to them. Uh, they're ready to, uh, to open up their future. Uh, one of them may be your CEO someday, uh, which would be a pretty exciting thing. Philip, uh, Bill, uh, Chang, I wanted to just uh, close with any comments from you. Look, I'll start. Look, I know we're at the end of time. Awesome experience. Really excited to see where this, where we've come in a short time. This was the pilot project, as you said, Jeff. We're looking to scale this out next year. You know, we've discussed scaling it out internationally. So, uh, you know, I think we've lit the spark here and you see the opportunity and the potential. That's what's so exciting and rewarding with, you know, the future generation of, of the, you know, the builders of the uh, digital infrastructure. I, I completely echo Philip's comment. Uh, great job team. Uh, I'm I'm really having a proud mama bear moment um, <laughs> to see how far you guys have come. Um, you know, and you know, just for everyone's visibility, the the architecture students joined this program uh, or, or, or this project. Um, uh, I believe two months behind uh, the engineering students and had to very quickly come up to speed with all of the activities and requirements for designing a data center. And you, to see where you guys started till now is just, uh, I am just in awe of everything that you guys have produced. So uh, just absolutely impressive job. Yeah, just kind of echoing all of this, um, you know, it's, 
it, it's so special to see everybody doing just such a great job and, and, and really contributing to something that's really architecturally and just, it's a complicated process, right? You're building a digital infrastructure. And what's amazing here is that every single one of you designing this are seeing that data centers are way bigger than, you know, big buildings and blinking lights. Um, you know, spending some time with the groups yesterday uh, evening, seeing some of these results and some of these presentations, I saw that building a data center is a full STEAM approach. I'm using an A in there for arts, right? So science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. I, I'm not, I'm not going to give it away. There was a, there was a, a very interesting looking, I don't know if it was a gecko or a lizard in one of the presentations. I'm just going to stop right there because it's going to be a lot of fun to see that and actually hear how that's explanation explained in the design. But that's the arts, right? Getting creative with building this kind of stuff. Um, I can't wait to be more involved uh, with other schools and other institutions, certainly with Hampton University as well. Uh, and just like uh, Jeff mentioned, a great way to participate is if a student reaches out to one of the lead mentors and we can't answer a question, if we have a Rolodex of amazing people we can call out to, just to get an additional piece of information. I know I did that. I and mean, look, like advanced power schematics are not my not my thing. So I would ask um, somebody else from our team for, for a little bit of help. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep staying inspired. Can't wait for the next group. Uh, I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go drink some more coffee now. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. So we need to wrap up. We have another presentation that starts right away. I want to just close by saying thank you to the R Mason partner companies who make all this possible. It's, it's uh, you know, their support of iMasons that allow us to put time into coordinating activities like this. So uh, thank you very much to our foundation partner companies and to our Keystone and Capital partner companies. And congratulations to the students for, uh, um, you know, delivering. I look forward to seeing you guys soon.